So, how did they all arrive at Old Trafford? I'll never forget, Matt was the biggest con man you ever met in your life, but beautiful was it. I remember coming down to the club the first time I game. I'd never met the, the fella in my life, and he had such a great name in Scotland. There always a little bit in awe of him. I think possibly even the lads when down through the years, there's still a little bit in awe of him as well. Getting into the, his office at Old Trafford and trying to get a sort of decent wage and what he was going to give me to come to Manchester United. <laughs> God almighty, he conned me to death, death. But I'm saying lovely with him. He was a great, great man and a great manager to play for. I can't believe that. How can you con a Scotsman oh, on money? Well, <laughs> don't, forget, don't forget he was a Scotsman as well. I think I get the same wage that he got when he played for Manchester City in the 30s. Are you going to let us know how much that was? 40, 45 quid a week it was then, which was, well, obviously was a lot of money then because the ordinary working man would have been on about 12 or 14 quid a week, but even at that, I didn't think it was a great deal. Steve, did you get much more than that out of uh, Tommy Doherty when he came for you in, in very different circumstances? You, you were more known as a, a university yeah. student who had the odd game for Tranmere Rovers. Well, it's quite funny in a way, like, I was playing part-time for Tranmere, I got £10 a week. And when I was told that United were interested, uh, Dave Russell, who was then manager of Tranmere, said, listen, I've told them you're earning £30 a week. <laughs> so if he asks you, tell him you're earning 30 First question Doc asked, how much you're earning? I said, oh, 30 He said, I'll double it. And to this day, I think he just did it for effect. If I'd have said they'd been earning 50 he said, oh, I'll double it, just to try and impress me. So I actually signed for 60 so... Not much more, not much more. No, I, I, funny, funny enough, I was involved with Tommy Dock at the time at Old Traft. I remember it was Bill Shankler that mentioned Steve to Manchester United. And I happened to go with Tommy Dock, but Tommy didn't believe little Dave Russell. Dave was another Scotsman. I mean, I don't know if Dave was getting something out of it, was he? I don't know. <laughs> Never gave me any of it. <laughs> Brian, actually, you're the only one of the four to be signed by an Englishman. <laughs> and, of course, uh, perhaps uh, the money was... Uh, slightly different terms then, and we won't press you on that, but it was a very lavish <laughs> signing, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, we, will, yeah. well, we will press you on that. <laughs> well, it was at the time, because I was at West Brom, um, I was at £140 a week, I was on at West Brom at that, at that time, and that was when I was playing for England as well, I'd made my debut for England, and so when Ron Atkinson, he'd phoned me a few times saying he was interested in me coming up to United, and um, obviously he made me a substantial <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think it was a wee bit different for myself though than Paddy Anstey because like Steve says he was uh, part time and uh, there wasn't much of a transfer fee involved where I come up as the, the record buy at one and a half million uh, which obviously gave me a lot more bargaining power than what Paddy or Steve had. Um, you know but I've always enjoyed it at the club and I made the right move. You certainly did. It was a very lavish affair though actually signing uh out on the pitch, that, that was the sort of Ron Atkinson showman way, was it? Yeah, with more experience behind me now, I don't know whether I would have done it that way again, but uh, that was Ron's idea at the time and the chairman, and um, it went down well because it was a good uh, team talk for the boys, wasn't it? I mean, they went on to win the game 5 Do you remember <laughs> that, that funny haircut you had, that curly? <laughs> that was my wig pad. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, what about uh, your recollections, most recent of the four of uh, being... Uh, I was going to say tapped up by Manchester United, that's the wrong expression, but being approached by Manchester United. Yeah, well, I thought I was going to join United six months before I actually did, because we played at United on Boxing Day, uh, and uh, Brian Clafford disappeared into Alex Ferguson's office trying to sell me at the, the two o'clock on the Saturday afternoon. Uh, they couldn't agree between £200,000, so in the end I played for Forest and had a nightmare. But then I always knew <laughs> that after that, that I would end up at Old Trafford regardless, and... Uh, I think it just took an afternoon, that's a couple of hours, discussing personal terms and that was it. I'd signed, I'd signed him, but we played Scotland at Hamden the following week, uh, I'd, uh, I'd signed for United. I mean, you were a, an England player by then, uh, does it, is it a romantic thing to say that, that Manchester United meant something very special to you? Oh, definitely, I mean, it's, uh, I think Brian Clough could understand me going because he always wanted to be manager of Manchester United, I think that's what... Uh, hurt him more than anything that he didn't actually get the chance to manage the biggest club and uh, I mean he wished me well but he hasn't spoken to me since anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it took me longer than two hours and I'm front with him on true. Uh, we did spend a quiet afternoon at cup final day uh, over a couple of cups of coffee and discussing uh, 
whether I should come to Old Trafford or not. But he tried to sell me a house next door to him. And like, <laughs> <laughs> it's got a deal with the estate agents oh, as well. Done, uh, <laughs> Fit out my league. What sort of Manchester United was it, Pat, when you came? Is it very, very different looking back to the Manchester United of today? There was nobody get any preferential treatment from anybody. I'm sure it's still the same today. Maybe the lads will tell, tell you better. But there was no preferential treatment. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody that worked in the stadium. I'm talking about all the groundsmen that worked there. And there's a wee, there's a wee little lady there that now I believe works in the little bar they've got at Old Trafford. Mrs. Burgess. She's still there, Mrs. Yeah. Day. We used to go down to the ground every morning about half past nine and she had a little wee pokey place where she kept all her little brushes that she swept the offices with and she used to make the best cup of tea and you'd go in there and you'd meet everybody in there about half past nine in the morning. I think, that's, training. I think that's a policy that comes around our club though from, from other places where because ours is such a big club you yeah. get the smaller clubs they'll say well we've got a nice happy family atmosphere within the club and People tend to think that you can't get that at a club as big yeah. as Old Trafford. Where, to me, ever since I've been here, I mean, you get on great with people, and the players, as far as I've always found, have always gone really well together. Best Lauren Charlton, so much has been... Bad players, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, per, from a personal point of view, Pat, what are your, your memories of, of lining up alongside them? Oh, great to play with. We're all great players in their own right, and I think the fortunate thing about playing with the team at that time, you could have an off day, but you would never get three players of that quality that would all have an off day at the same day. You'd get one of them that might have a good day and the other two might not be as good, and that, that, that won the game for you. And if the three of them clicked well, that was something else. Best is up front. There he is, the defence split. Can he do it? He surely must. Lloyd only set it up the best to Charlton. What a goal! Ball streaking away down the middle with Charlton beside him. And over comes the centre trying to find it. That's low! What a goal! What a goal! George Best. So two dummies and an hour's made a chance for himself. His hat trick! Charlton taking over, best breaking, and in a great position to break too. This looks bad. What a great goal, George Best and referee John Gow clapping his hands together and saying, well done too. Morgan, Ferrand outside him on the right, doesn't need to use him. Aston trying to set it up for Best. Oh yes indeed, how about that fella? Oh here's Law again. He's searching for another goal. And he's found it. Dennis Law. Our best. Law. Best. We picked up that kid flick. Driven wide. Yes! Everybody talks about poor George since he stopped playing him. I talked to him not very long ago and he's, he's done an autobiography. And he was asking me about what he was doing for the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you remember better than he did. <laughs> possibly, possibly. Steve, well, uh, they were in the second division when you signed, which seems yeah, uh, it, amazing it, now. Yeah. Yeah. It was an exciting time, I think. It was, it was like the Phoenix re-emerging almost. Like they'd, they'd gone down to the second, and then they obviously took the second division by storm, and the place was so lively. That's the one thing I remember. You know, just to add to what Brian says, like it had a reputation, you know, it's called Cold Trafford occasionally, and it, I'd always said when I was at Tranmere, if I did get a move, I wanted to go to a nice, warm, friendly club. And uh, the prospect of going to United was a little bit frightening at first, but when you do meet the people there, and the people have been there, like Donkey's years, yeah. Mrs. B I know, knew very well, I'm still yeah. know when I go back there, and all the people are the same. And it's a nice, friendly club, and uh, as I say, when I was first went there, it was, it was just so exciting, that was the thing that, it struck me, like the dock had the team ready to go and the crowd was going wild. It's brilliant. McCalliog and on again for McElroy. Good early cross. This away was defected. And the one from Pearson. Pearson, well kept in. Just McCarry in the middle. Greenock going into.
Makari's header, Pearson, number three! Green off, touched out for McElroy. Four hungry forwards waiting in the area for a cross. McElroy goes for the shot, Pearson! He's had trick! That was one of the things at that time where Steve, um, I think he learned his lesson off Martin Buck and, and Gordon Hill, I think, a little story that was uh, going about at that time. <laughs> Steve was come out as a... Uh, a hard working winger where Gordon was, everybody would say, was maybe a little bit lazy sometimes and a flair player. But Martin, Martin had a Gordon in one of them. Gordon had lost the ball up, he was up in the left wing position, he'd gone on a maze and he didn't hear anybody shout. And Martin Buchan had done one of his very rare overlapping runs. He got a nosebleed when he got the other box. And Martin was sort of chugging on his way back and as he passed Gordon he called him something. And he clipped him over the year. <laughs> I remember that. That yeah. was QPR. Yeah. Old Trafford. You safe thought he'd never get a thick ear. Every day Martin asked me the ball. Yeah, mate, you can have it. Don't worry about it. What of one of the great 70s characters, the fiery little Scotsman, Lou Macari? Yeah, Lou Macari, I mean, he was always up to pranks whenever. And I always remember when we were playing Juventus in the European Cup Winners' Cup semi final. The first leg was at Old Trafford. And what, what our uh, press used to do, they used to get a press game against whichever country we were playing against, so this time it was the Italian press that were all over, and they used to play it at the Cliff Training Ground. And so anyway, they're going on having the game, and there was a few of us in the treatment room, like, having to look out the window, watching them play. So Louis thought this was a great idea, takes a pair of scissors downstairs, goes into the Italian dressing room, and he snipped off all their socks, the toes <laughs> of the socks, and put it in the teapot. Well, if everybody knows the Italians, how they love the dress, I mean, they haven't just got the cotton socks like we all have, like, you know, like, all silk socks and there's pink, there's yellow, there's every colour, like, and anyway, he's cut all the toes off and put them in the teapot. I would love to have seen their faces when they go back in the dressing room. Neil, what about the present, the present dressing room now, and the, who are the wisecrackers there? present company included, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I'm the quiet one, I think. I think what, the one of the loudest ones is Incy, isn't it, really? I mean, he comes in and typical London Cockney lad, and he check the lad and that. Brian McClare's the, the, the one that I it's taken me up till now to fathom him out. Because <laughs> <laughs> he is very deep and he says things and I sit there and I think, does he mean it or and what oh. he says and it oh it's all the lads get crazy. the dictionary out the pocket. <laughs> you know, everybody carries the dictionary on the inside pocket just to find out what Brian's been saying. <laughs> and Nick he's the one that has to uh, designate a nickname to every particular player. Uh, and, he, and he takes it takes ages thinking of a new, I mean, he'll spend all morning thinking of a nickname for, for a new player. Go on then, give us a few examples. <laughs> give us a few examples. <laughs> <laughs> I know what mine is, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, of course, is, he's called Chucky, isn't he? That's a, that's yeah, he's himself. called Chucky. It took me six months to fathom out why he was called that as well. But, you know, obviously, obviously, it's very simple in the end. Uh, I mean, he's called God. <laughs> he calls him God. But, um. Talking of dressing rooms, but there's a story that's gone down in legend about you breaking a, a mirror in a European oh, tie. Is it true? Oh, you never looked in it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look in it, actually. It was in um, Benfica. In the 5-1 game? Yeah. Cup quarter final or something, and kicking the ball up against the wall. It's hard to hit the mirror. I was never very good at passing it anyway. <laughs> Hitting the smell and smashed it in smithereens and everybody went very quiet. I mean, it didn't bother me in the least bit because I've never been superstitious in my life. It was quite funny because it worked. We were three up after 15 minutes. It was amazing. Some people say that, that that's the best that uh, that Manchester United side ever played. I would think that's the best, the best performance I've ever played in any team in my life was in Benfica that night. They had never lost a European Cup tie at home. And We'd beaten them 3-2 at Old Trafford and everybody was thinking, well, would it be enough one goal? And I don't think the way goals counted doubles then anyway. But we were three up in 15 minutes. It was funny about poor Mark, because Matt had said to his look lads, we're one up, just keep it a little bit tight for 10 or 15 minutes till the game settles down. And well, obviously everybody listened except George. George <laughs> ran a mock, scored two and made one. <laughs> three up after 15 minutes, you wouldn't believe it. And after that, it was plain sailing. George Best began his night of mischief at Benfica's expense.